Here we go. Right. Good morning and welcome to uh, this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing this morning, and then it's posted to our website for you to watch at your convenience. Um, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our recordings. Both the live show and our archived recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, and if you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. For those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is a state agency for libraries, so similar to your whatever state library. Um, so we provide uh, services to all types of libraries in the state. So we'll have um, topics on our show for all types of libraries. So um, public, K-12, academic, corrections, museums, archives. Uh, really, our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries, something cool that libraries are doing, um, some resources or services we want to offer to libraries. Uh, so it's all sorts of things you'll find on our show. We do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, um, demos of services and products. Um, we bring in guest speakers from um, across the country, across the state, across the country sometimes. Um, but we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff that talk about um, services and things we're offering to the commission. And that's what we have today. Uh, well, we have Library Commission staff not necessarily talk, not talking about services that we offer, <laughs> talking about what they've been doing um, as they've been going to a library school and uh, working in a library at the same time. So. Um, with us today, I'm just going to have you guys, you know, so you can introduce yourselves and talk about who you are and what you do at the commission and uh, what you're doing with library school and get right into the presentation. So, no, um, Linda, if you want to start. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Linda, and I do um, interlibrary loan and reference services here at the library commission. I'm going to go to my first slide. Um, I am a MLIS student right now at San Jose State University's iSchool, and I'm in my second semester, and it's a lot of work, and I like it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> End of show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Amy, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, hi, I'm Amy Irons. Uh, I also work at the Nebraska Library Commission. I'm in the TBBS. Uh, department right now, which is the talking books and braille service for blind and handicapped here in Nebraska, and sometimes we outsource to a couple other states. And I am also currently in um, the University of Nebraska Omaha's Library Science Program. I have a two year degree from a community college from about 10 years ago. <laughs> and so now I'm continuing to finish my bachelor's to move on to my master's. So I definitely have a different perspective on what library school is like, you know. 10, 15 years ago is what it's like now. Mm -hmm. And I am a big old nerd, so I am loving school. So I'm about a year in, uh, but I already, so I'm about a junior for my bachelor's right now. I'm a junior. Um, and I'm gonna finish that up oh, with a minor in art history. Oh, cool. Yeah. And um, yeah, you've already met Krista. Yeah, and I see. Yeah, you put me in here that I've I've done mine. Um, and I actually looked it up because it's, it's been a while. And I will full disclosure. I will say I uh, received my um, master's in library science in 1991. Um, Interesting. <laughs> so um, there, and I got mine. Um, I'm originally from New York, so I went to SUNY Albany, State University of New York at Albany, um, their library science program. Um, I did cool. it. I'm going to edit the slide for when we when we uh, save it so that I can put that in there. Okay, sure. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to jump right in. Um, uh, I was looking for recent um, information about how many um, grad school students and and undergrad students are working full time while they're in school. And there wasn't a lot of reliable recent information, but this um, Georgetown site for um, the, they have a whole website about the relationship between education and the workplace. And it's great research. Um, anybody looking for uh, 
more papers to fill out whatever research project they're on, go look there. They have a lot of good stuff. Um, so um, some key findings from this report from 2015 were that one third of working learners are 30 and older. Um, of the 14 million working learners, 19% have children. Um, I'm not going to be able to speak to that, but Amy might be able to speak to that. Um, the 25% of all working learners are simultaneously employed full-time and enrolled in college full-time. And that 40% of undergraduates and 76% of graduate students work at least 30 hours a week. That is a lot. And some acronyms that we're probably going to use in this session, um, just to be clear what they are, and some links to find out more information. The FAFSA, I would say that if you're even thinking about going to library school or grad school or any sort of school, the, one of the first things you want to do is fill out the FAFSA. Um, even if you think you won't qualify for federal student aid, the school that you enroll in might have some grants, might have some uh, whatever sort of scholarships that you might not know about. Um, and, but to get any of that stuff, you're going to have to fill out the FAFSA. And if you fill out the FAFSA, you can um, select which schools you want the information sent to. And that's a pretty good way to get those schools to contact you. They're, if you get your FAFSA information sent to a school, they will they will be contacting you with some catalogs and stuff like that. Um, the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, this is a whole, uh, a whole big topic that you won't really have to worry about until you're out of school, but it's something to be aware of. Um, there's a program right now, and this will probably change before we get out of school, but right now, if you make a minimum payment regularly every month for 10 years, you can then apply for the rest of your um, student loans, certain kinds of student loans to be forgiven. And it applies if you work in uh, nonprofits um, and government organizations of certain types and libraries and museums qualify for that. Um, ALA, the American Library Association, this is where you want to look and make sure that the program you're getting into is accredited. You don't want to get a degree from a non-accredited program because a lot of jobs require that the, um, your degree be accredited. And I know somebody who got a degree from an unaccredited program and had to go back to school to get another degree. So you don't want to, you don't want to have to do that. Mm -hmm. um, MLS, MLIS, there's a lot of different um, acronyms for the kind of degree that you can get. You might get a master's in librarianship. You might get there's a lot of degrees. It depends on the school that you go to. So for more information about that, there's if you click on that link for the uh, ALA, they have some more information there. Um, um, and yeah. That the links over here. I didn't mention before. Um, this live presentation will be available along with a recording afterwards after the show. Yeah. So um, don't worry about trying to scribble down all these URLs or links or anything. You'll have access to this and be able to click on them later to get to all of these. Yeah, I, I, I put in a lot of links at the end. Anything I refer to, there's going to be a screen at the end with cool. reference to check out. Um, and the GRE, everyone's afraid of the GRE. Um, I kind of, I'm a, I like taking tests though, so I was actually looking forward to taking the GRE. Call me crazy, but my program didn't require it. Um, your program might not require it. A lot of <laughs> library science programs don't. So if, if, the idea of taking the GRE is keeping you from going back to school. You might not have to take it. Um, if you want more information about the GRE, there's information at that link, but you might, your program will let you know whether or not you have to take it. Okay, finding a program. Um, yeah, uh, you wanna ask, the people that you work with, especially ones who share your interests or approaches to problem solving, people who, um, you know, are doing things that you think are interesting, ask them where they went to school, ask them how they liked it. They might tell you they went to a place that they don't recommend to you, and that's good information to have, too. Mm -hmm. um, ALA has a list. Oh, there's supposed to be a link there. 
congrats. I'll put that in. Um, and it's the link from the previous slide that is the list of accredited programs. Um, I, I've said it already, but it's important enough to say again, make sure your program is accredited. Um, social media groups are a good way to find out more information. I found out from uh, on Facebook, uh, ALA Think Tank, people discuss it constantly, um, talk about what's good and not good about their programs. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, don't let that be the only place you get information, but it is a good way to get recent information, um, what's happening recently, but you definitely don't just rely on social media for that information. Um, the when you're interested in the school, you know, look, go to their website and find out the requirements for GRE, residency, tuition, any um, second or third languages that you need. Most library science programs, to my knowledge, don't require a second language, but um, don't take that for granted. Um, and then let's see, if the program's online, you want to make sure what the in-person requirements are, if any. And once again, you want to make sure the program is accredited. Okay, um, that's my dog. <laughs> um, and you're going to get a lot of advice. Um, and some of it is good advice for you, and some of it is good advice for other people. Um, so, you know, use use your judgment. If somebody is telling you something is important or you've got to do something, you've got to do it this way, but it doesn't seem right to you, um, use common sense and, and get more information. Um, yeah. So, Amy, did you, did you get a lot of advice from people about where to go to school and what to? Well, actually here at uh, Nebraska, Library Commission, there was only one, like you had to go to a certain school and do the program in order for them to reimburse your tuition <laughs> from, from our bylaws. So you could uh, only have the bachelor program from UNO and then uh, master's from, I think, Missouri, Kent State. Is that where we have ours? So I didn't, and which is fine because UNO is very, you know, very close to me, even though I do online. Uh, so that choice was kind of made for me, but I know like Emporia University, you know, you hear a lot about different library programs across the country that are really good. Mm -hmm. And so definitely there's a lot of information out there to check out which one would work best for you. And a lot of them are online completely, which is super convenient and really great, especially for, you know, people who are adults and are working full time like us. And I have a child and, you know, um, so yeah, it's really flexible and wonderful. I wouldn't be able to do it if I had to do in-person classes. Yeah, um, and I think there's something that, important to mention too, because you talked previously, Linda, about filling out the FAFSA form for financial aid, but then Amy mentioned tuition reimbursement from wherever you're working at. Yeah. Um, that is definitely something to investigate uh, if that would be a possibility. Well, yes. no, honestly, that's the only, you know, that's the reason I went back to school is that because my job really encourages it and really wants people to get their mm -hmm. library degrees. And had it not been an option, I doubt I would have gone back to because you know you you kind of you don't get into library sciences for the you know the big paycheck so it didn't <laughs> you know it didn't seem cost effective for me to go back to school um, because I wouldn't necessarily make that much more an hour in terms of my salary if I did but when it was offered to me essentially you know we'll pay for you to go back to school I jumped at the chance yeah 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 and I'm, I'm getting tuition assistance too to go to San Jose State um, and it would not be feasible uh, otherwise, I don't think, uh, would not be a decision I made. So that is a, a thing to look at. If, um, if you are looking for a job while you're in school, that, um, to look for places that offer tuition reimbursement is, and uh, a, yeah. An amazing amount of grants and scholarships for library students, uh, mm -hmm. especially going back to school. I mean, when I was, considering doing this before, I, I mean, the list is huge. So there is a lot of help and assistance out there for library students. Yeah, definitely. And I've noticed that um, library school programs seem to be 
my, my school was already online, 100% online, even before the pandemic. And so the their transition to pandemic teaching was pretty seamless. Um, and that was, uh, it seems that library, library school programs have, because of the nature of what they're teaching, um, have been good about trying to make information available in the easiest way possible to their students um, by offering as much online as they can. So, yeah. Um, to move on to the next slide about um, keeping it professional. So if you're in, if you're going back to school as an adult, you might find yourself in a situation, I have, where you are older than your professor. Um, and even in that case, it's always good to err on the side of formality with a professor. If the first time you email a professor, maybe don't call them by their first name. Um, even if you met them in public, you would. Um, you don't know what the professor had to go to to get to where they are, um, go through to get to where they are. So, um, but you don't need to be overly formal. If the, a lot of times a professor will in the early on announcements say how they want to be addressed. And if they don't, um, you can ask them. Um, err on the side of formality, say, uh, you know, good afternoon, doctor so-and-so, if they're a doctor or professor so-and-so, if they're not a doctor. Um, and then you can say in, in that email, how would you like me to address you? Um, that kind of politeness can go a long way. Um, class discussions online can get casual. They want us to be able to talk to each other um, and have a free flowing share of ideas, but watch how casual you get. Um, I mean, judge the room uh, as far as like your use of language or description of anything PG or R rated. Um, TMI. Yeah, TMI. Too much <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, everybody's going to see everything behind you on Zoom. Um, so, it, you might be fine with sharing everything about your life. You might not be. Um, I've I've worked on for my uh, classes. I've kind of made a screen out of all of the um, stuff, the cardboard boxes I got shipped to my house uh, during the pandemic, trying to make a, a nice little screen out of that to have behind me. Um, but uh, it can be less visually distracting to, so the people are actually listening to what you're saying if there's not a whole lot going on behind you. Um, so group work, um, you wanna keep it professional in your group work. There's gonna be a whole slide later on about group work because everybody loves group work, right? Um, and if you're talking in social media groups geared towards your cohort, don't assume that what you're saying stays in the group. Um, I've seen in a Facebook group that was geared towards my cohort in a previous iteration where people uh, made comments that were um, uh, maybe they shouldn't have made about uh, professors. Just remember um, anything that you put online can be brought up again later. So just, um, keep it professional even when you think that nothing will leave the group. Um, some things to set up for yourself. The earlier you do these things, the better, but it's never too late to make changes to help yourself out. Um, you do want a dedicated place for schoolwork, even if it's the, a small little table and chair, even if it's one corner of a room in your house, um, just a place where your mindset can be about school. And if you are lucky enough to have a place like this at home, it's also good to have a backup um, in case you something happens at home, you know, your 
landlord decides to replace your roof or uh, there's a power outage in your neighborhood or something like that, to have a backup of a place where you could go, a coffee shop or a, a library in your town um, where you know you can go to to work um, if you can't work at home. And if you are doing schoolwork at home, the fastest internet package you can afford is probably a good idea, um, especially if you're sharing your home with other people, friends or family. You don't want somebody's streaming video games to slow down your uh, class um, meeting video. Um, the you don't want your homework to have to suffer because stuff takes a long time to download or anything like that. Um, Can I yeah. about uh, there's a ton of government programs, especially during the pandemic, that can especially for adult students will give you free internet, will pay for your internet, uh, often your school will have programs that you can get uh, some kind of discount on your internet. So definitely check out those things for uh, your internet providers if you're in school. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. I'm gonna add that to the slide because that, that is a really important point. Um, there's, yeah, that it's kind of in flux. There's a, um, your community might provide um, all kinds of different services or, or packages. So definitely take Amy's advice there and look into it. Um, so you're also going to need to talk with your friends, your family, your family of choice, your coworkers as well about um, the fact that you're in school and like what this means for how available you are. Um, and it's not like you're going to be able to have this conversation and say, well, I, you know, sometimes I won't be as available to do things. And then it's not like then that's settled and you'll never have to talk about it again for the next three years. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll just, you know, work on the communication about this. And um, the more you communicate about it, the better it works, I think. Um, it's good to talk to other people that are in your same situation who are working and going to school, um, either people in your classes, friends and family that you already know, or people online, just so that you can talk to people about the, the frustrations and successes in a way that they will understand that maybe other people in your life who aren't in the same exact situation won't understand. And you want to get as much health care as you can. It's This is a fraught topic, and it's different depending on where you live. But one thing, especially uh, vision care, mm -hmm. um, it might be time for reading glasses. It might be time for computer glasses. I've had to wear glasses since I was in third grade, so I don't have any sort of hang up about needing glasses. But um, I know sometimes as people think of that as a sign of getting old or something, but your your eyes. Um, as we all put on our glasses and be like, oh yeah, I need to wear these. <laughs> and it can happen um, really. Your your vision degrades really gradually, so you might not even realize. When I am um, working at home more during the pandemic, I was mostly working on a laptop, and then when I came back to work and I was working on a a screen hey, my, that that looks different than the laptop in my lap did and um, it it turns out um, that what what all those those uh, diagrams you see about how the ergonomic situation for your desk um, and how you should be looking straight across at your screen your glasses are probably calibrated so that you look down to read correctly. Mm -hmm. So you might, if that's not working for you, if, if the straight across more ergonomic um, placement of your monitors is not working for you, you might want to lower your monitors or look into getting computer glasses. I'm sorry to say that, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, okay, there's my dog again. Um, so, uh, yeah, you got to take breaks. You got to remember to breathe. 
um, when I was looking through advice, I asked on uh, one of my uh, social media groups for my, my cohort, um, what advice would you give in this webinar that I'm gonna do? And a lot of the, the advice was, you know, don't make yourself crazy with this. You're you're gonna do what you can do. Don't worry about it. Just just keep your head down and keep working. And then a lot of people were giving advice like, you'll sleep when you're dead. Keep going. Work hard. You can do it. And so there's there's different kinds of approaches. Um, and you'll know which one is right for you. You might be the kind of person who's happier if you get four hours of sleep a night and, and work like crazy and get that uh, get that 4.0. Um, but if you're not that kind of person and you uh, you would rather take some breaks and that's how you learn, then you know just remember to do what do what is right for you. Um, so, um, hey, Amy, in your, um, in your studies, are you, do you have the option of like looking at certain, at different things about library school? Are you looking into, like, are you only learning about archive stuff or? Well, and here, you know, here's book stuff. the whole antithesis of the library career is that uh, it is so multifaceted. Like you can specialize yeah. in anything that you could think of. Like there's, you know, there's fashion libraries, there's there's art libraries, there's law libraries. You know, so if you have, you know, so like the the main uh, degree is library sciences, and so that really focuses on the actual in the library, and most of the time it's focused on public or academic. And so, you know, you're learning your reference, you're learning your circulation, you're, you're cataloging. And then I think what a lot of students do is their minor is what they would like to specialize in. Like, I am an artist and I love art history, so I decided to do a minor in art history. Now, whether or not that will facilitate a job someday, you know, my dream job working in a, you know, a museum as their archivist or their cataloger of their materials, that would be amazing. But that's what's so great about librarianship is that, you know, you don't get stagnant or you don't have to. If you like being a children's librarian and you want to stay in that and do that for 30 years, that's awesome. But if you, you know, there's opportunities for you to constantly learn new things. And librarianship is a growing organism. That's one of the um, five laws of librarianship is that it's a growing organism, organism that we are constantly evolving to serve the public as we go on. And also we are constantly evolving as ourselves as librarians. We can... You know, you get tired of doing one thing, hey, learn a new skill, go somewhere else and do something else. That's what's so great about it. And so I found that uh, I, you know, when I realized that I could get a minor in art history, I got really excited. <laughs> because I tend yeah. to do, you know, I think everyone could think that they, you know, you do better in classes and learning in subjects that you enjoy and that you're interested in. You know, yeah. when I was like in high school, like I didn't do so well in math or, you know, uh, calculus or things like that because I wasn't very interested, but I excelled in English and art and things like that. So definitely, you know, go for things that interest you. Yeah. Okay. So if, if you're if you're working in a library and you go back to library school, it's going to come up that you know, okay, it's time to do a research project. Do I want to research what I already do because I'm familiar with this mm -hmm. or and it will help me at work, or do I want to research something else entirely? Um, what is what is the right way to go? And the answer is that there is no right answer. Um, oh. Yeah, um, you don't want to limit yourself. If something really interests you, you don't want to close off researching that because you're never going to get a better opportunity than mm -hmm. when you're in school. But um, you don't want to completely unmoor yourself from what you already know. So if you uh, think, well, I'm kind of interested in, um, I'm interested in, in children's library work, you know, maybe look at that 
uh, do a little research before you decide to spend a whole class on that. You know, maybe you want to do children's library work, but then you realize that maybe you don't like being around children. You know, that's probably not a good, <laughs> a good field for you just because you like kids' books. Mm -hmm. if you don't like kids, and you, your, your feelings may change. I know when I started library school, I assumed I was going to go into public libraries as, as yeah. a final job because that's all I really kind of knew. I yeah. gone to the public library since I was a little kid. My parents every Saturday. Um, mom worked and dad took us to the library it was a thing I mean since I was little yeah. I was assumed that I would go into and then once I finished my degree I ended up getting a job in a university and I never looked back I was I just stayed there I never ended up in a public library yeah yeah and that's funny. loving it and I think now um I am in in, in awe and and of public librarians because mm -hmm. now that I hear more oh so I was only seeing it from the outside not the behind right. the scenes in the reality and now right. I know the value from hearing public librarians talk about it and I know I could never do that <laughs> right right it's I better I, I took you were talking about don't take classes that you wouldn't be I took a um, government documents class in library school and I can't remember if it was a required or elective at this point but it was about doing gov docs work and I learned that's something I could never do either as an actual yeah. job <laughs> No, this is my head just is exploding about this. It just can't wrap my mind around that kind of those kind of documents. And that's fine. I didn't end up in cataloging at all. I was referenced and that was my yeah. But I took the class and then learned don't go that direction. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so yeah, you might take a class and then when you're done, you might be like, Well, I learned something there and one of the things I learned is I don't want to do that anymore. Um that's very early on that I was not cataloging. <laughs> Mark record. I mean, it's nicer now since Mark records are mostly online, and so you can sort of copy paste them. But man, ten, you know, fifteen years ago, they didn't really have that that much, and so you had to make your Mark records yourself. Oh, if yeah. you haven't cataloged your class yet with Mark records, ooh, ooh, good luck to you. Hell <laughs> yeah, that's another people catalogers bow down to you. <laughs> yeah, some of yeah. people love it. Mm -hmm. Um, along the along that lines, like. I, one thing that I look at, um, I, I get on as many uh, email lists of things that interest me as much as I can. And I have them go to one folder on my Outlook um, so that I, they're not coming in all day needing to be read. But when I um, have time, maybe once a week, I just scroll through and see what's in there. And there's a lot of job postings. And it's interesting to see, you know, like who's hiring and, you know, catalogers are always hiring for catalogers. There's always posts for that. Um, so that's another thing to think about, too, is, you know, if you do if you think, well, I want to be uh, I have a friend in Washington who's a, a maritime archivist and he loves it. But there if I wouldn't go into school thinking I'm going to be a maritime archivist because there aren't that many jobs in that. <laughs> so you might want to think about, um, you know, if there, if there is, I, for, I would love to be uh, an archivist at uh, a design house, uh, like looking at, at couture garments, but again, there's not that many jobs in that field. Um, you'd need to be, have a very specific plan of attack to get to a job like that. But, um, yeah. Um, so you do you want to be aware of drop deadlines and don't feel bad if you drop a class. If you get into a class and you're like, this is not for me, this is this is a bad idea. Um, go, you know, drop it. There's no shame in dropping a class. And if you haven't if you don't drop a single class the whole time you're in school, I, I you know, you might not have taken as many chances as you should have. Um, uh, just yeah, watch, watch the watch the deadlines so that you 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 don't pay for a class that you that you drop. I was going to take a couple classes this summer and after and they're accelerated in the summer and so I took the first one and it was a lot you know it was young adult yeah. literature so we had to read a lot and so then my next class was coming up a week later he's like you know what I'm going to take a break I'm getting a little burned out and so I just went ahead and dropped that second class for the, for the summer and just took like a month and a half off before the fall. And I tell you, I needed that. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's that reminds, along the lines when I was getting like two kinds of advice. 
one, take it easy, don't do more than you can do, and the other one, sleep when you're dead. Um, the <laughs> it's it's good to for me. I I don't want to take classes in summer. I want to have summer off. Um, it helps me reset for the rest of the year. I think that I do better work the rest of the year if I don't take classes in the summer. For some people, they want to be in school all the time. So it's you know summer is summer classes are good for some people and not for others. Don't feel bad if they're not for you, but don't feel bad if they are for you either. Um, yeah. So even if you take a class that is in a field where you you think you know everything. Um, I'm in a database class right now. It's kind of an intro database class that I have to take as a prerequisite for other classes. Um, I, I basically live in a database at, here at work. So, you know, I could be like, oh, I know all this. I'm not going to learn anything in this class, but I'm going into it with um, looking to see what I don't already know or what, what might change how I think about what I think I already know. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to learn, even if it's a class that you that you think you know everything, you might get some surprises out of it, you know. Um, so let's see. And when you do end up in a group assignment, though, it is good to clarify with your group a level of familiarity with a topic or project or, or assignment. I had a, a group assignment where um, we had to work on a vision statement and a budget for a library. And it turned out one of the people in the group had just done this at her library and she had been in charge of it. And so her coming in and telling us all like, here's what I'm familiar with, that um, took the pressure off us thinking that we needed to be that we then we knew we weren't all on exactly even ground um, so if you know if you're going into a project and you have a lot of familiarity or expertise in that on the topic just let people know so that they know um, you know how to split the project up better um, let's see and you may um, have a class where you have a, a project that is where you get to pick a topic and maybe you want to pick a topic that you worked on in a previous class. Um, it's that can usually be OK. You probably you might want to communicate with your professor and say, hey, I did this previous work in this area and I want to continue working on that. Um, they can give you some advice and your uh, the writing center at your school can give you some advice as well about how to not uh, self plagiarize um, how to create work that is um, still authentic but effective um, okay back to group work um, you're going to have to do group projects in almost every library school program. And you might think, why do I have to do this now? I, I work in a group at work. I, I am an adult. I already know how to work with other people. Um, and I, I used to be hesitant about group work, and I've come to appreciate it. Um, and you kind of have to frame it for yourself in a way that you'll uh, appreciate it too. It'll be a lot easier for you if you do. Um, I My experience with group work in grad school is it's a lot better than it was in undergrad. I finished my undergrad as a non-traditional student. I was in groups with uh, people half my age who were more interested in, you know, talking to each other about where a party was and uh, other things like that instead of trying to just get our work done and get out of there. Um, but in grad school, there's a different level of commitment from the people in your group. Um, I'm not saying that you're not going to get somebody who won't do work, but 
you have a much better chance of like-minded people who want to do the work to get the project done and and get the project done well. Um, it's a good way to learn about other jobs, other libraries, other perspectives. Um, again, I said this previously, but you do want to clarify your level of familiarity with a topic or project or assignment. And the the school I'm I, I'm in in San Jose State, they have an introductory class where you have to form a group um, and you have to have an agenda and you have to have a group charter and it was a really good um, good uh, first step back into the group project waters. Um, group charters are really important and I'm, I'm gonna I'll put a link to that in the uh, a link to examples of charters in the in this presentation before we put it online. Um, there will be surprises in group work and your professor knows that. If you, if it turns out that I was in a group project where um, a really smart, reliable, uh, intelligent student who worked really hard had to drop out because of a family issue and um, the professor, you know, we, the professor understood that that's going to happen. It's, it's not like you have to wonder, mm -hmm. oh, what is the professor going to do to us because we lost a group member? Um, they will be able, they'll, they'll work with you. Your professor is not there waiting to fail you. Your professor wants you to succeed. And so just communicate with them if problems come up. Uh, another breathing breathing screen. Um, so yeah, don't aim for perfection. Do aim to learn. Even if you're used to being the best, even if you hate making mistakes, the most important thing you're going to learn in, in grad school especially is that you need to let that go. Um, it's Homework will expand to fill the time if you let it. You could do homework 24 hours a day. You don't have to do that. I agree. It's really it's really difficult to find the balance, especially yeah. I feel like adult students or you know students that are coming back after a long period or have families and children and and busy busy lives that uh, they want to just succeed so much. Like I suffer from that myself. Like I have a 4.0 and like I get irritated if I miss a couple points on assignment, even though I still have an A, even though it's fine, even though the professor knows I'm more than capable and like I'm organized and I do all my, my homework and things, I still get on myself. And so I try to really give myself a break about that. You know, you really yeah. have to find the good balance. So for example, um, I take an art history course and so it's all online. So, but you have to watch, you know, at least three hours of lecture a week for that chapter in the book or whatever. But, you know, I know not to sit down and try to do it all at once. Like I, you know, on Monday I'll watch like 45 minutes of it and then Wednesday I'll come back and continue it. And so you kind of have to split it up into manageable bites so as to not overwhelm yourself and really don't try to get so hard on yourself about being perfect or getting a perfect score yeah. or anything like that. As long as you're learning, as long as you're absorbing the information, I think that's yeah. Important. And I'm, I mean, I'm talking big here, but I also have a 4.0 and it does matter to me too. I, I, I try <laughs> um, not to make it matter, so, but it's, yeah, <laughs> I never had a 4.0 in my life. I don't think. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know what, when you, when you, if, if you're in school and you're, you know, all that's going to matter is just that degree. They're not going to care if you have a 4.0. They don't care. If yeah, you, I don't think I've ever been asked in an interview what my GPA was, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, real quick, because I see we're getting close to the end, so I'm going to zip through this one. Um, what if I don't have my first library job? So this has mostly been geared towards uh, library workers in library school, but your program will help you. Talk to your advisor. Um, use program resources to get an internship as early in the process as possible if you don't already work in a library. Um, 
the ex library working experience, paid or unpaid, is probably as important in getting a library job as a degree is, um, in my experience. Uh, uh, of the three library jobs yeah. I've had, one experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, so take advantage of any reduced rate for professional organizations or conferences. This applies if you're already working in a library. I got to join the Society uh, of the SAA of Archive Society um, for free uh, because paid for through my school. So take advantage of that. Um, sign up for email lists using your personal email. This is a tip from me. This your moves might vary. Um, so that you still have access even after you graduate. And this applies if you're already working in a library. Um, and while conferences are still virtual, attend as many as you can. Oh, yeah. And look for and those then, rates. You're, you're working in a library as a professional, but you're also a student. Yeah. That student yeah. rate option for any of those um, yes, I, conferences I up, or professional organizations. Yes, I sign up for student rate. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely. So some self-care. Uh, don't quit. Don't quit. Your program will have resources to help you if you feel like quitting. Um, you might be able to take a semester off if you have a big life event that makes school feel impossible, but it's easier to take a semester off and come back than it is to quit. So don't think that just because you something is going on that you have to quit. Um, and if possible, have some scheduled nights, days, or weekend days where you do not do any homework. For me, that's Monday night. I, on Monday nights, it, I am tired. I do not, uh, it's just not very effective use of my time to do any homework. So it, when possible, I don't do homework on Monday nights. Um, so schedule your homework time and reschedule as needed. You could do homework 24 hours a day if you let that happen and you don't wanna let that happen. So just try and figure out times in the week uh, when you look at your your course load, like, okay, on, on Tuesday, I'm going to do some reading. On Wednesday, I'm going to do my posts. On Thursday, just try to make it a pattern, and it'll be easier to fall into it. And if one week goes badly, that's, that's okay. You know, you can make the next week better. Um, a whole other webinar, Plan Easy Nutrition. Um, you can tell I used to be a food blogger that I put that in there. Uh, and then take full advantage of any counseling or health care that your program provides. Be kind to yourself. You can do it. One of the things that a uh, piece of advice that doesn't work for everybody, but uh, I say, like, eat the whole donut. Like, don't take half a donut. Just take a whole, take a whole donut. <laughs> Um, some technical tips, uh, using a tablet to read PDFs can give you more flexibility. Um, you can read them, you know, curled up on the couch, uh, if you want to do that to yourself. So, um, figuring out a way to get your, the PDFs that you need to read onto a, a tablet, if you have one, um, can give you more flexibility than sitting at a, a desk and reading. Depending on your tablet or device, you might be able to set a night reading function that is easier on your eyes, back to the eye health. Um, your college or university library is your friend. They can help you and they want to help you. Interlibrary loan, that's what I do. It yeah. might be a possibility for your textbooks. So like I, I bought my textbooks because I like to underline. You do. But I, uh, <laughs> I got a copy of one of my textbooks on interlibrary loan so that I can have it here at work at my desk. So in case uh, I take a coffee break and have a minute, um, I have it to read. I haven't actually opened that book yet though, that copy, that's funny. I've only opened it at home, but it's there if I need it. It, it makes me feel secure. Um, social media groups for students at your school might be another source for used textbooks. I see that uh, in some groups I'm in and if you still want to read for pleasure, of course you do. Yeah. Audiobooks. Mm -hmm. um, if you, you know, your eyes get tired of reading, you're tired of reading, listen to some audiobooks. Let someone read to you. 
<laughs> yeah, let someone read to you. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I just finished one in the car on my way to work today that was so good. Um, so here's the references. Um, I'll add a couple of links to this before we post it. Mm. Thank you for attending. Yeah. Um, thank you, Amy and Linda. Um, I actually want to bring in uh, someone else here, uh, and I'm going to unmute you now, Laura, so don't panic. I've unmuted you from my side. You can unmute yourself. Uh, Laura, Laura England Biggs is the library director at our um, uh, Key Memorial Library in Fremont. And she is actually in the University of Missouri, the Missouri program right now. So she is, same thing, she has a new program. Hey, Laura. Hey, actually, I'm not in the program now. I graduated in 2006, but I work for the program. Oh. And I'm the library liaison for Nebraska. So if anyone has any questions about attending University of Missouri at Columbia's MLS program, they can reach out to me either at Keen or at englandle at missouri.edu. I also run the practicum program, so I appreciate you talking about how important those internships and practicums are. Mm -hmm. um, so when you were in, in the program yourself, it was when you were actually working too, though, right? Yes, I was working full time the whole time. And everything you said, big amen. <laughs> I love the being respectful with your professor and asking how they want to be addressed because I'd rather you call me Professor England Biggs and let me say, call me Laura. Yeah. But yeah, so I'm- for Other perspective library students, like there is a huge network of librarians. Like we, all we want to do is help each other and talk to each other and network. And like, there's so many resources out there. And anytime you want an internship or I swear, you will meet at least 12 people who are just as zany and insane about libraries as you are. And they just, like, we'll just try to convert you into our, our tribe. <laughs> the University of Missouri is like San Jose. We are completely online. We do not require the GRE. Um, there are resources for scholarships, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, put my plug in for the Tigers. <laughs> I know a lot of people here um, in this area have gone there because it is, you know, yeah. local ish, you know, nearby. Yeah. We do offer in state tuition as well. Oh, nice to Nebraska. For Nebraska, it's a reciprocal agreement. Nice. 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 Um, I had a question. It's only slipped my mind. Okay. <laughs> Oh, practicums. Yes, dating experience um, at an actual library is a great idea. We highly encourage that as well at the Library Commission. We offer internship grants to libraries to um, pay, paid internships um, for uh, libraries to bring in someone who's a college student or high school student who um, hopefully might be interested in becoming a librarian afterwards. <laughs> Uh, so we highly recommend libraries to reach out to us to apply for one of those grants if you know someone who's interested um, or if you're, you know, interested in it, you know, contact your local, here in Nebraska at least, contact your local public library and say, hey, can you apply for one of these? Um, right now, our internship grants are open. Just give a little uh, uh, push <laughs> about that for uh, next year. Also, so, um and Krista would know more about this than I do, but if you're like, okay, you're, if you're watching this and you're in Nebraska and you're thinking you want to do this, but you're not sure, um, the commission offers some library education and maybe you want to take one of those classes and that can give you a feeling, you know, uh, for what it would be like to be back in school. That's true. Yes, our um, we have what we call our basic skills program, which is um, for anyone to take who is a um, working at a Nebraska library or just a Nebraska citizen. It, you don't have to be at working at an actual library, and it's a series of classes throughout the year on different aspects of librarianship. Um, 
main reason is for some of our staff who have not been through an official library school program, but they need some of the training and education for that, they can take these courses. So it's kind of like a mini version of going to full on library school. I might <laughs> um, overview more, but um, yeah, anyone who wants to can jump into those Nebraska citizens and try one and see, you know, what, and you will talk to lots of other librarians. So it's a good way also for yeah. networking. That is, that's a really, that's a fantastic thing that the commission offers. That is a um, one of those things. I remember when I first learned about it, I was like, that can't be real. That's such a good deal. <laughs> So that's definitely look into that. And I'll I'll add a link to that to the uh presentation, even though that's on our website already. I mean, we were talking here about you know working in a library and going actually to get your MLS, your master's in library science, but we here at the Library Commission, we know being in a very rural state, um with lots of small communities and small libraries, one person libraries, we do have a lot of library staff, library directors who just don't have the ability to go to school. It's just not going to be able to be a thing for them, but we know they need the training to do their jobs. So that was the original reasoning for this basic skills program is for all of the people that just library school they can't do, they can, you know, get the training throughout. It also has other purposes as well. They can get their public librarian certification by taking those classes, which helps getting jobs in Nebraska as a whole connected. Yeah. Um, but that's not a requirement either. You can just take a class because you want to. Yeah. Um, All right, so we did just hit 11 a.m. Central Time. Um, anybody um, online have any uh, questions, comments, anything else you want to share about your um, experiences or questions you have for Linda, Amy, or Laura, who's here with us too? Um, go ahead and type into your question section. And what I'm going to do while we see, I'm going to pull presenter control back to my screen because I want to show you guys while we're waiting here. Um, Oh, Laura says she's got to go to the next meeting. Thank you so much, Laura. Hopefully, people will be in touch with you. Um, the grant I was just talking about, the internship grants if you want to work in a library. But also, we do offer here in Nebraska, and if you're not in Nebraska, look in your own state to your state library, continuing education and training grants, CE grants, that we can help you um, take certain educational courses. Um, the grant information here and these, these grants are going to open up for the next year in October so you can do online learning courses um, you can have, okay, we can help you pay for attending conferences or workshops or doing major CE or training projects at your library with these CE courses so if you're looking for other kind of continuing education and training that's another uh, way to go I, I took one of those cataloging classes, yeah, um, which I think will, will help me when I take the cataloging class. Oh, sure. Next semester. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I think we'll wrap it up. Sure nobody who's has any questions, desperate urgent questions you want to ask right now, that's fine. Um, contact Amy, Linda, or Laura if you're interested in the Missouri program, to, if you do have any questions. Uh, our recording will be available here is our Encompass Live website with our upcoming shows and then our archives are linked right here. Uh, today's show will be at the top of the list. So you'll see that there uh, by the end of the day tomorrow at the latest, um, as long as YouTube and GoToWebinar cooperate with me. Um, everyone who attended this morning and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's available. Uh, there'll be a link to the recording on our YouTube channel and a link to Linda's slides, which she's going to do some editing and updating too, and then we'll get the <laughs> updated version on here. Uh, we do have a search feature I'll mention while we're here, so you can see you can search our show archives if you want to look for any other topics we've had on the show, or if there's been a topic you're interested in. Uh, you can search the full archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want something to limit it to just current. Uh, that is because this is our full show archives, and I'm not going to scroll all the way back, but this goes back to when uh, Encompass Live premiered in January 2009. So um, we're at, what, 12 something years, <laughs> and they're all here. So it's a huge list. Uh, uh, just pay attention, though, then, since this is a full archive, when you are watching a recording, when the original broadcast date was. 
Um, many of these shows will stand the test of time and still be good, useful info, but some things may become outdated. Um, services or programs may have changed drastically. Links may be broken. Things might not exist anymore 10 years later. Um, so just pay attention. Um, but we are librarians, archivists, as you mentioned, Linda, and we will keep, as long as we have a place to host them, we'll keep all of our archives up here, um, all of our recordings on the page. Um, Encompass Live also has a Facebook page. If you like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. You get reminders about our show. Here's a reminder to log in today's show. When recordings are available, here's a reminder that last week's recording went up. We'll post them on here. Um, we also have a hashtag Encump Live that we'll use on Twitter and Instagram that we post things on there. So if you'd like to keep an eye on us there as well. Uh, right. My camera decided to die at the end there. <laughs> huh? Oh, <laughs> you're back. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for being here this morning. Thank you, Linda and Amy. This was great information. Hopefully we'll get some more um, librarians in the field interested in attending library school. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kathy. We encourage and support it. Thank you, everybody. Um, and I hope you join us next week when we're talking about education, but a different uh, point of view. Connect Ed Nebraska. It's a way of uh, schools um, getting wireless internet access and that they can actually work with libraries to expand that. Um, I'll let Brett Beaver explain it more next week uh, in more, you know, I, don't know, I only half understand exactly how they're doing this, but <laughs> it's a great resource for libraries and schools to help with um, getting internet connection to students. And um, also any of our upcoming shows, go ahead and register for them. As you see, I got September all filled in here, and I've got so I've got another October date that I'm going to get put up there. So um, keep your eyes open on our schedule. Uh, one reminder, as because it's coming up, we once a week, once a year, we do not do Encompass Live, and it's the week of our state library conference. The Nebraska Library Association Annual Conference. So this year it is on you know, um, the week of October 13th. There will be no Encompass Live that week. So um, attend NLA if you're here in Nebraska. Um, you can see here there is partially in-person day and there's virtual day. So you can do which, whichever works for you. Uh, so thank you everybody for being with us here this morning and hopefully we'll see you on a future Encompass Live. Bye-bye.